Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF, the special series sponsored by HP. And you know, in our continuing episodes about, you know, workflow and, and some of the different tools you can use, we are finally today having a discussion about hardware. Yeah, we're talking about designing for technical and creative professionals and designing the systems that they will use, not the software necessarily, but all of that is a, an ecosystem. And that's kind of goes along li the lines of the collaboration, the cooperation, and all the things that we have been looking at in terms of a, I'm going to call it a holistic process and a holistic experience that uh, HP has been uh, promoting and working within. So what we found is, is that they practice what they preach in terms of how they design things and how they expect other people to be able to use them. So they're using the tools just like you and I. And that's what I think is so fun about this episode today is that we're getting a little insight into how they're creating the hardware, which is what so many of you are out there doing when you're creating 3D print output is a product, right? It's something hard. And so, you know, thinking about that is it's not always, you know, digital. And so let's take a listen to that sort of processing and what they're going through internally. So today we have Merrill Matthew. He's coming on. He was originally from Dallas, Texas and pursued a path to pharmacy in college, but realized his, his passion was in art and design quickly. Um, he uh, pursued a, a career path in industrial design starting in Detroit, and uh, he has a background in automotive design and the opportunity to work on interior designs for Ram and Jeep. And then he has been working a uh, on Z books, um, HP Z books, along with the talented team at HP. And he works in the department Z by HP and working on the Z workstations and, and the um, creative studio and the other things that they have going on there. So let's hear from Meryl. Hey Meryl, thanks for joining us on WTFFF today. It's great to have you on the show. Hi, thank you for having me. You know, um, I think it's very important to have your perspective, because while we've talked to people involved in software and we've talked to people involved in, you know, hardware in terms of the 3D printers, we have really not spoken to anyone involved in the hardware of the actual laptops, workstations, backpacks, you know, that HP has available for the hardware side of the component. And you are on the ID team and have been directly involved in creating the design of these workstations. And I think that must be very important in the impression that people have, you know, about the hardware that they're using. And in some ways, it's just as important as the software. Yeah, I would think it makes a lot of sense to take a look at that in terms of how is that helping you with your workflow better? Yeah, I mean, when we were working on the Z, we had to really think about the, the product. And it wasn't just about packaging some of the parts into this device. We had to really think about the people that we were designing for. Uh, when we were thinking about how we're going to build this workstation, we wanted to see how it would resonate with customers today. So every customer, you know, when they're building something, they're always passionate about their creation when developing their product. So we wanted to make sure we designed a tool that makes that process feel seamless. So there was a huge emphasis on workflow. When we talk about workflow, we had to focus on some of the, the main aspects. Like for example, in, in 3D CAD, the keyboard, the display, the performance, they all have to work homogeneously in our systems to deliver the best experience. So our focus on when we're developing this product was to build that best tool to enhance that workflow. You know, it, it strikes me as like there are so many characteristics of things that we don't think about. Um, we don't always do that. We, we buy a computer, right? We don't, we aren't necessarily thinking about like, does this fit my workflow? And then later you find out it's not working really well for what you want it to do. Like we've recently just discovered here that not every computer is created equal when you now have to go on Zoom and do virtual backgrounds. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't know I needed to buy that and I only bought a computer six months ago, you know, that kind of thing. So we, yeah. we really have to think harder about these. Uh, choices that we're making, not just in the software, but in the hardware that we're using to make sure they run smoothly and do what we want. Yeah, so you're trying to build, you know, uh, buy device, for example, our Z Studio and our Z Create, our, our notebooks, our workstation notebooks that just recently been released. Um, you have to think about what kind of um, um, performance you're, you're trying to um, adhere to. So, for example, when you look at the processor, if you're doing 3D printing, you have to look at the right specs it, and how, what it will do for that device. Um, for software like SOLIDWORKS, 
you look at like for the processor, you look at the, the core SOLIDWORKS is predominantly single threaded, meaning that um, it can solve one task at a time. So if you're trying to build a, a 3D part and you want to do stress tests on the materials, you have to look at high end processing power, like Intel Xeon processor chips, instead of investing in a machine with a lot of processing cores, which is probably more suitable for rendering. You also have to take into consideration the, the, the memory. I always say it's always important to give yourself some extra room for memory in the future. I've run into situations where I've run out of memory and it slows down the performance when multitasking, when you're like rendering in the background on a different application while you're working in 3D CAD. So the, the sweet spots for most users is between 16 to 32 gigabytes. And third thing that we focus um, on performance is the GPU. Um, there's a huge stress on GPU today in the industry. When you're designing in 3D CAD, we spend a lot of time zooming, panning, rotating. And so Z Studio focus on these use cases and we outfit their GPUs for these specific tasks. So when you're rendering, like a high-end GPU will save you more render time, uh, making you more productive and enhancing your workflow. So in a rendering use case, uh, the Z-Create is a useful device for video editors and game developers to handle applications like Unreal Engine, Adobe Premiere, or Maya. So it's important to outfit your device with like a high end GPU. And I think those are the three components that you have to take into consideration when you're looking at buying a, 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 any type of workstation today. Well, now, when you've been designing, you know, you've been involved in several different projects with a lot of these different kinds of hardware solutions, if I remember right. And the technology changes so fast, you know, in terms of the needs and what the software demands are, that's got to be challenging. So I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. But then also the impression that maybe a device that was intended for gaming needs to be changed to make the right impression in a corporate environment presentation world haven't you had to deal with some of those things yeah because i mean you you guys sell to a lot of technical and creative professionals um mm -hmm. not just hobbyists so you've got you know both or going not just gamers not right? just gamers right yeah exactly right. yeah we are seeing a lot more of uh, gaming notebooks enter um the workstation uh, industry today and it, i think it's uh, becoming very very competitive and i think when we t when we start looking at how we can uh, differentiate ourselves we have to focus you know the the workflow and the core performance of our notebooks and when you look at um the workstation device also you have to consider what makes this workstation more professional than a, a gaming device you know i think it's so interesting that we are looking at you know I, I i kind of like in hardware because people come to us all the time to design products right and they think oh mm. we're just designing the pretty aesthetic on the outside and it, it's a lot of education on our part and i feel like if that's what we're getting from you as well that it's it's we have to know what it's going to be used for how it might be used in the future how it might be misused <laughs> like there's a whole bunch of bigger picture things and it's it's sort of like designing a a building and a room within the building right and mm -hmm. we don't know what's going to happen in that we in that building we, you may intend for it to be a conference space today but tomorrow it might be a training room and the day after that it might be a series of private offices so we don't know what's going to happen with it and so many people look at that and say okay well i'm just gonna drive make everything generic and we're gonna just do it up to this standard i'm not gonna worry and think about that and and you guys have taken the different approach. You've said, no, I want to get in. I want to understand the creative mindset, the workflow. And I want to be ahead of that to understand where it might be going so we can do a better job of giving them something that they're investing in buying. And it's going to get more than just, you know, short-term use out of it. Right. Yeah. That's one of the, the things that we f focus on is, you know, today, especially during this, this pandemic, uh, we're all, all working remotely from our homes. And so we've noticed um, issues that we, for example, when we're conferencing, we may have audio issues or even uh, camera issues. And so we're taking these things into more higher consideration as we You're continue You're experiencing them yourself and then incorporating exactly. it into the new plan. <laughs> That's Absolutely. good. I noticed on the list, quiet keyboards. Okay, I'm an ad I would like quiet keyboards on every single computer. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Because we tend to record in the rooms where other people are and we would love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the challenges that uh, we wanted to focus on uh, was that we didn't want to just compromise on our keyboard. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had a very thin profile, but also if you're building a thin profile, you have to consider all the components underneath. 
the chassis. And so we had to think about the, the fans for the thermals. Um, we had to think about the keyboard. And so because the fans sit uh, right below the keyboard, we had to think about the key travel. And uh, one of the complaints from users that we uh, interviewed is that the key travel, they wanted a very distinct key travel. So we looked at 1.3 millimeter key travel. And uh, that's very important because uh, we think about force displacement, which in mechanics is when the object moves from one point to another. And so it provides them tactile feedback and it makes that workflow very important. So if the key travel isn't right, the, the experience isn't optimal. And then and also- if it's too much, it's loud. <laughs> so. It is, yes. And so we had to put dampeners underneath the key to provide that uh, quiet experience. And that was also another important because is an important aspect because the uh, creators are working now in different spaces. We have the gig economy and a lot of people are working from home. So you don't want to create disturbance. So that was very important. As much as we had uh, high key travel, it was a very important to apply those scissor mechanisms to have that dampening. Boy, experience. I got to try one of these. You have one there you can show us I, because I'm yes. a loud typer. Oh, really loud. Oh, yeah, right. It drives yeah. me crazy. <laughs> So this is our Z Studio. We just wow, just got cool. released this much, and you can Ooh. see the thin profile. Wow, yeah. that's really so, thin. Yeah, so, love it. That's so great. So for those of you listening, there's video of this on, on the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com, and you'll be able to check that out, and you can see the little show off of but the thin seriously, profile. But seriously, I'm a loud typer. I'll make people want to leave the room. <laughs> it's that bad. bad. Yeah. So I would, I would love to try uh, one of these quiet keyboards, and that might bring some peace to our office environment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there, uh, there is no typing allowed in the bedroom. Like that is the rule in our house. There is no computers and no typing allowed because it's so loud. I'm a loud typer too. And sometimes people may think I'm sending out an angry email, but I'm really not. <laughs> That's it. Right. <laughs> That's the thing. I think people think, what is wrong with you? It's like, I don't know. I'm just typing. Yeah. What's going but, on? But you know, these are like, these seem like minor things. But at the yeah. end, they all goes to both the user experience of it. And that's what you guys have done to the nth degree here is that you're, you're really looking at the user experience of everything. You're, you're always making progressive improvements to making sure that you're ready for the next step in the next future, which is mm -hmm. what I want to touch on next. I mean, you're looking mm -hmm. at, there are lots of, you know, as you put it, gaming systems entering into the professional environments, that, but there's also VR entering into those professional environments. So now we have this, but they're not necessarily being used for gaming purposes. They're being used for design purposes and development purposes. So we, yeah. we now have to have even more robust systems to start incorporating and being able to utilize those. You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you project out and forecast out and trend out to decide, is this worth bringing, building in now or do we wait? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a fine line because, you know, if, for example, VR, um, it was a very, it's a trending topic and I still think it's a very, it's a trending topic. I think the technology still has, needs some improvement. So, uh, for example, in the VR case, uh, we look at how can V, we actually have VR today in our Z studio. We have, we have the application available. There's three things that we want to think about when you're like building something in CAD in VR. There's one aspect is you're actually designing the part product or building the actual product. Then there's the second part is you're visualizing the product or rendering the product and you can see it in VR with different materials. And then there's a third aspect, which is you can do a simulation test in VR, whether you're rotating and moving the tool or you can see if there's an inflection point for breaking the product. With the Z Studio and Z Create, we want to create a device that functions well across all these creative applications, whether you're in Adobe Suite or 3D modeling in Rhino, SolidWorks, or Katia, uh, or rendering in Keyshot. So there isn't a one size machine that fits for all your applications. So we like to understand what the customer wants uh, before we point them to the direction of this, this Z Create is better for you or the Z Studio is better for you. So you're um, thinking about that based on how they work, how you design the machine, how the whole system works together. You're helping to guide them best into the solution that's gonna work the longest for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Before desktops were the ideal setup for workstations and now, because we have the introduction of mobile workstations, you know, we can achieve an identical performance because of the technology we have today. So we want to <laughs> so use that technology to cater to these customers so they can, they can enhance their work environments and their workflows. So how has the emergence of 3D printing, especially with the multi-jet fusion printers from HP, how has that changed your approach to some of the, the hardware needs, you know, and the configurations of these workstations? Um, or, or your sorry, own design process, yeah. Or, I mean, we're just wondering how, how has 
you know, 3D printing now, which is mm -hmm. obviously what this podcast is primarily about, but as a part of the workflow and all that, how has that informed or changed some of what you're working on with these workstation solutions? Uh, for 3D printing, uh, so, you know, one of the things that we're constantly looking at is um, from a, the 3D industry is that, you know, we're looking at from a manufacturing perspective, how this will open up opportunities with for the user to design things in new ways, um, whether it's in parametrics or just by through surfaces. So we have challenges today with the limited capabilities, how we construct our chassis for our notebooks or our desktops. And so we want to make sure with with it withstands our durability requirements in the commercial space. So with 3D printing, we want to see how this will develop as 3D printing introduced new ways to print or mold or assemble materials from a high volume manufacturing perspective. So you're gonna you're thinking about maybe how you might incorporate 3D print parts and other things like that. I also want to know though, has it changed the way you design hardware? It hasn't changed the design uh, way we design hardware yet because we haven't started 3D printing parts yet. But we have what we have done is uh, we've been rapid prototyping a lot of our parts during the initial phase of uh, the development. And so, 3D printing is uh, is something that we take advantage of a lot from in, from that perspective because we even though we see things on screen and when we're building a product out, there's nothing better than actually seeing the device in your own hands, even if it's uh, even if it's out of some sort of polymer because we like to feel what the customer is experiencing, you know, and just make sure we hold in our hands and, and understand, is this the right material um, that we're going to implement on this device? So today uh, we do a lot of uh, rent cuts and to just get a sample size of our one-to-one -one scale of our products. And so it is uh, something that we take advantage of um, daily when we're constantly developing product. Mm, I bet that has sped things up for you. <laughs> Oh yeah, it has. I, I, I talk to people who have worked a lot, lot longer in the industry as designers and they are very envious of all the capabilities we have now that they didn't have before. So. <laughs> yeah, I think about that all the time because we, our, our, we started designing furniture really early on. So, and furniture is oh, cool. so large scale, right? We just did a foam core and like, you know, and cardboard models and all of those things. And, and then just, just being able to even scale in a small scale has helped out tremendously to like before you move up into the bigger scale. So yeah, we get how it has helped move it through. But, you know, I, bef I really want to also touch on because we've, we've been going over in this series, we talked about generative design and just sort of the whole uh, workflow, the creative workflow process in and of itself. What are the questions I should be asking myself before I go out there and buy it, especially when I'm considering my creative workflow, generative design, and all of these things that I might be using it for? What questions should I ask myself? I think you have to ask yourself what what are what are the the needs that you're you're using this device for when you're built when you're using a workstation you can outfit it to the highest gpu but do you need the highest graphic performance or do you, do you need the highest cores um depending on whether you're um building a model or you're rendering a model they're very different applications and so for example if you're rendering you'll need more cores but you might not need more cores when you're building the product in CAD. So I think it's, it's good to educate yourself on what are the, the requirements that you need for the type of applications. And if you go to our workstation website, you can actually see based on the, the, the softwares you use that we basically put together based on your needs, the type of product you're looking for. So your and ideal so. workstation. I love that. You know, it, it makes me think about something you did say earlier, which is that thinking about maybe overbuying. And, and you know what, I think that's really true. Like you, you need to buy for the future, not for where you are today. So when I, you know, I go in to buy a computer, sometimes I'm, my, my thought process is simply, gosh, I just keep running out of hard disk space. Like that's the only problem I want to solve, but that's not actually the solution because I keep running out of hard disk space because I'm, I'm, I'm rendering videos and I'm doing all of these other things. I need a system that does more. And so asking yourself the what, which is what we're here all here about on, on WTFFF, because it stands for what the fuse film at fabrication. So mm -hmm. the what is really critically important is what you want to do with this in order to get out what you want in the future. Yeah, I found it really... Um, something you said earlier made a lot of sense where, you know, you could be overbuying on your processor and the number of cores and you think you're buying this workstation that's going to 
you know, help you be more efficient. And the reality is depending on the software, you may only need one core processor, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the tricky part. So I think it's, it's very important to dial in what you kind of work you're going to be doing the most and how you're going to be most efficient in doing that. And I, I RAM may be a universal thing. Hey, we all need more RAM, right? <laughs> we, we could all use, you know, 32 gigabytes of RAM, but in, it's not all about, short-term memory it's about you know the different ways things get processed so yeah rendering being a lot more intensive versus you know creating models in cad i wonder how does that change with some of the vr stuff and some of these i think modeling in 3d and some of these vr worlds maybe you need you do you need it all um if you're it depends on what you're trying to do in vr uh from a visual standpoint if you're if you're trying to build something in cad we don't necessarily you know build something in cad using vr because you're looking at the display but if you're trying to render something in keyshot and you want to see it in a vr perspective I, it saves you that print time so you can quickly see what your product looks like before you actually take it to the 3d printer and i think it creates that gap where you know you're not printing things unnecessarily and wasting material. And I think when the scale's all wrong and the size, you like overdid it. Yeah, oh, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the other problems that I think we've found over the over our careers in designing in general is color accuracy. That it's, and nowadays, you know, so much of our work doesn't actually end up in print. A lot of it just ends up in digital. Mm -hmm. um, how has that been challenging the hardware development? Uh, been, it's been uh, very challenging because, um, you know, every, when we look at different panels, um, they all have a different set of uh, color gamuts and nits. And so um, our best uh, display is our dream color display. And it's the most accurate um, in terms of rendering in Keyshot. And then if you were to, you're looking at the material choices that are available. And it's important that the, uh, the color is very accurate. I think we got enough from you just saying how important it is. So we're okay, good with okay. that. How fast is really the pace of development of these workstations? How quickly are they changing? And and it must be challenging for you, I would think. Yeah, the, the it's very challenging because uh, the you know the technology um, every year we there's always some uh, new device that comes out with better technology. Um, it's a thinner profile, and so we're always c competing with our markets to make sure we we keep up with the trends because otherwise there's just so many choices available now today with workstations so it takes a two it's a two-year life cycle usually for developing the product and the first year the first few months is really just concepting the idea of and trying to build a story around what are we trying to build here and then the the, the next year and a half we're just just constantly grinding with engineers and iteration after iteration. Yeah. yeah. And it's a, it's a fun process. It's very challenging because every, um, our engineering department, marketing, project management, they all, everyone has, you know, their uh, requirements that they need to follow. And, um, at HP where everybody works very well together here. And so it's been a, it's been a positive experience and that's why we were able to develop the Z crazy studio the way it did. Um, but it was, it was uh, a lot of long nights and a lot of, uh, conferencing with our partners in, overseas in Asia and, and here in, in California. So it's very uh, tight. Even those two years, it's constant iterations and the, the time goes by so quick. So, <laughs> wow. I bet it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, Meryl, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate the, little, the insights you've given us into the d hardware development and the, and the workflow um, side of things. So appreciate that. Oh, thank you guys. And I thank you for having me for this podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, boy, I have to tell you, working in hardware has got to be tough. It's fast paced. The technology changes all the time. A but two it's not year fast cycle, enough. <laughs> but a two year cycle. So you're work, starting to work on a project that is not got, a product's not going to be on the market for two more years. How do you predict all of that? Well, you know, that's the interesting part. So when we were talking about Merrill at the beginning, we mentioned that he had a background in automotive design. And I know from my early days in automotive design that the life cycle is incredibly long. It can be 10 years or 12 years sometimes from the time that you begin designing parts and, and interior fabrics. That's what I was working on in my early days and working on these components that are going to be a decade out. And how do you know what the world's going to be like in a decade? I mean, look, we change in a matter of months now. So it's a 
a super challenging job to design something that's hardware related because you have to be so careful in the design process. You have to consider everything. You have to test everything. You have to model everything because the output is expensive in hardware, right? We all know that when we go to tool for things, when we go to make them, we have to be sure we're right about it. So we can't cut corners. But at the same time, we can't take so long to get to market that the market's not there anymore by the time we get it out. So these challenges um, go along lines. And I, it makes me sit, sit back and think about how many things over the years that we've come to to say, we need a workstation upgrade. We need to change our computer. We need to do these things. Like we just did that with our, our middle daughter. She's going into sixth grade and we had only gotten our computer a couple of years ago. So it's not, it wasn't even that old, her original computer. But the reality is, is that she's doing so much video editing that it was no longer capable of it. And it was taking her so long and she was getting frustrated. And of course, because she was in school, it was like one of these closed off systems too. So like she wasn't open enough to download the software she needed and to do the things she wanted to do. So we had to go out and look for a new system. Well, and, and I think that's the key. Like anything, you've got to have the right tool in order to accomplish your goals. So I think knowing exactly what kind of software you need, how much time are you gonna spend modeling something versus rendering something? How important is it to have that color accuracy from what you're seeing on the screen? So you gotta have the right monitor, you know, as compared to, you know, what the end product is gonna be. Otherwise you're gonna end up designing something that is not gonna meet the needs of that consumer at the end of the day. Right, and, and this is the thing. So considering that and taking into in the design process, working with a company like HP, obviously they have the ability to sort of project out. They see what's coming in software. They see what's coming in VR. They see what's coming in the 3D printing. And so they see what's on the forefront so they can be better at designing for that rather than responding to the market shift in that. So that's a great advantage for them. But on our side, we have to do a better job of, of asking those questions that um, Marilyn was talking about, that we need to ask the right questions for ourselves instead of responding to like, yeah, my hard drive is just chugging along and I can't stand it, or my fan's too loud, my keyboard's too, not quite enough. Like these are important, like nice to haves, but let's talk about the real core of our workflow and process. If we're using this for technical and creative use, right? If that's our purpose, if we're a professional, a creative professional, we need to make sure we're productive in our process. And if our computers, our hardware is slowing down our creative workflow, we're not doing ourselves or our clients or the company we're working for, we're doing them a disservice. So let's think hard about why we're buying something new, why we need it, what it's for, and what we think it might be for months out, a year out, so that we are also working towards our futures as well. Because these, you know, sometimes these workstations, especially when you're outfitting an entire office of staff of professionals, you're making a significant investment into that hardware. So you want to make some smart choices for the future and not, and not shortcut and, you know, and circumvent your productivity a few months down to save a few bucks today. And then we have to think about that. It's an investment in your, in your own productivity, not just an investment in a piece of hardware. It's not just a fixture. Yeah, it, and I think especially when you get to some of the applications that we've talked about in some of the other episodes of visualizing, you know, a very large interior architecture space, you know, that's that visualization, that rendering, and, and especially in a 3D environment, if you're in VR or something, I mean, my gosh, that you've got much different hardware, you know, considerations, right? Then if you're like me working in Rhino, that's really a lot less about visualization than it is constructing that model that is going to be visualized another way in 3D printing later, right? I mean, it's such different considerations. Yeah, you know, and I, and I think about it that a company like HP has such great advantages that other companies don't because they have so many different departments and divisions. But remember, we're really early on in the series when we were talking about the watching the mega trends and, and the global trends of what's going on, it makes them easier to shift and move and create and keep their development on flow for the changes because they're seeing the big data come through, they're seeing AI, they're getting informed by what they're seeing happening, not just in the buying patterns of their existing products, but also in the manufacturing process, supply chain management issues, sustainability issues, all those things are starting to inform a better design for the future. So there's these, these things are just built into the output, it built into the hardware when it comes out. And I think that that's fascinating because, you know, so often we, we get caught in this sort of quick cycle of development in so many places where they're just like, let's just respond to it and we'll make a marketing change and we'll just do this. 
you know what, that, that's not a viable long-term solution for those of us who need to invest in the system and use it for at least a certain period of time before we're ready to upgrade again. Like I'm getting frustrated right now with my computer. I just bought one not six months ago and our whole working environment changed, right? So now we're working from home. Now we're, I'm doing virtual conferences 10 times more than I was before, even though I was still doing them before. So I've had to up my presentation game and do all of that. And now I don't have a computer that's right for that. And that's frustrating because it's, I, it's brand new, right? And, wow. you know, but the work environment changed around me. And the, that's happening to so many people right now. Yeah. And, and as much as you try to predict it, it can be hard sometimes to predict it. But um, my solution is, okay, we'll end up repurposing your computer for another employee yep. and <laughs> get you what you need. Right. Because yeah. uh, it's making me less productive and making me less effective. And that's not an okay solution either. So, you know, this is where we have to think about our investment in our technology and in our whole software, our hardware, our research, the things we're going out there to test and learn. That's how we got into 3D printing to begin with, right? And then of course the output and the machines and the other things that we're using, we have to look at that in a more global way for ourselves and from an investment perspective and a productivity perspective. Because I think at the end of the day, that makes you make better choices in terms of how things are gonna work for you from a technical and creative perspective. Yeah, to me, productivity, well, Boy, it's really tough. I don't know how I would rate them. Productivity, I think, is huge because I get frustrated when I'm just sitting there and my computer is like chugging, trying to figure something out. But then again, creativity and visualization, I mean, there there's so many different things to balance as a designer. I, I want to be able to work the way I need to and be as creative as I need to on the one hand. On the other hand, I I need rapid response and feedback you know yeah. be to be able to stay very productive because maybe my time sitting idle is worth more <laughs> than, well that's a that's know, a creative professional challenge right yeah, or is. you know a technical professional and a creative professional maybe they're not the same thing maybe you have two different people in your organization sure. who are each taking those on and they actually don't need the same system and that's also another thing is like we, when we have small businesses, we can be more flexible and we can buy different systems for different people based on their needs. But when you have a big company, you start to, or as you scale up, you start to say, we just want to make one buy, we'll make it more efficient. And then you start rolling them out, but you find departments become inefficient that way. And so this is also a business scaling challenge for you yeah. when you have creative professionals and technical professionals within your organization. So some things to consider here. Definitely. Well, I think it's been great to focus a bit on, you know, hardware and some of those unique challenges. And it does really round out everything we've been talking about with some of the different people from HP in terms of the entire workflow. And it, it's isn't it amazing that this company has all those resources. Yeah. Like, we talked to so many different people, uh, so many different departments. It's really interesting. And we're moving into now, we're coming out of the design and workflow segment and we're moving into sort of more of the application side of things. So we're starting, we're going to start to hear some use cases and we're, and we're going to start to hear some different projects and other programs that are going on, including project captus, which is coming up, um, which is a really interesting because we're now talking about incorporating scanning into the whole process, which is a whole nother computer hardware challenge. So like you, start to add those things together so that's going to be an interesting segment as we as we move into the sort of last part of our series here awesome well hey stay tuned for those those episodes are coming out really soon yeah and, and don't forget that you all the resources for in this episode and all of the episodes in this series can be found at 3dstartpoint.com and if you want to check out the episodes you've missed to see exactly what's in the hp series you can go to 3dstartpoint.com forward slash hp and don't forget you know, uh, Meryl showed us the cool profile on video. So if you're listening to this, you got to go check out the video on uh, at the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. So thanks everyone for listening. All right. We'll talk to you next time. This has been Tom Hazard and Tracy Hazard on WTFFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3 dstartpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D. 